Romans chapter 3 was the New Testament's most influential chapter on the Protestant Reformation. In this presentation, we will look at how the Reformers like Martin Luther, John Calvin, Philip Melanchthon, and others discussed Romans 3 in their commentaries when they moved through the chapter on a verse-by-verse -verse basis. We will try to understand how they read this chapter against the backdrop of their confrontation with the Roman Catholic Church. And while this presentation is mostly about the Reformers, we will also consider a few of the ways that modern biblical scholarship has challenged both Catholic and Protestant readings of Romans 3. Verse 1. Paul asks, then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. In order to contextualize this and understand where we are, we need to take just a moment to talk about where Paul has been so far in Romans 1 and 2. He opens Romans by launching an invective against the Gentiles. He has this very typical anti-Gentile vice list. And a vice list uh, is a long list of blunders and mistakes that people have made. And when he talks about the Gentiles, he says, you know, they're full of envy and murder and strife, deceit, maliciousness, etc. And as he is saying these things, he sounds like a very conservative Jew who has a problem with the Gentiles. And indeed, he knows that the Jewish members in his audience are applauding him. They're saying, yes, that Paul is right on the money. These are all the things that are wrong with the Gentiles. We experience this, we see this on a daily basis. That's why it's surprising in Romans 2 when he turns the gun on the Jewish members of his audience, such as in verses 21 and 22. And he's explicitly talking to the Jews. And he says, those who preach against stealing, do you steal? Those who preach against adultery, do you commit adultery? And he doesn't simply reproduce all the sins that the Gentile people commit and say, well, Jews are doing them too. He adds some. Since Jews are supposed to be the representatives of the one true God, he echoes the words of the prophet Isaiah when he says, the nations are blaspheming God because of you. Jewish behavior is so bad that the Gentiles are now associating the Jewish God with Jewish bad behavior. And Paul says, that's not good at all. In fact, he goes further and he outlines a final judgment scenario where some Gentiles may triumph and some Jews may fail. Now, this would have been especially shocking and uh, even offensive to Jewish members of his audience who thought, well, as Abraham's seed, as those who inherit the promises, as those who have the covenant of circumcision and who have the law, we're probably going to be okay in the final day of judgment. In fact, when we look at the things that Jews wrote in the Second Temple period, in the period of Paul, uh, that's what they thought. They thought they were okay. They thought the Gentiles were in lots of trouble when the judgment day came. But in chapter 2 and verse 27, Paul says, there's a Gentile who's not circumcised who's going to condemn you, even though you are circumcised, because you violate the law. Now, when Paul says these things, he knows and can anticipate what Jews are going to say back to him. Well, uh, if you think that we're in the same trouble that the Gentiles are in the judgment, then you must think being Abraham's seed, being Jewish and having circumcision, that these things are of no benefit at all. And that's why Paul surprises us again at the outset of Romans 3 when he says, no, being Jewish and being circumcised, uh, these are beneficial much in every way. Pali kata pata tropon. And so it's here at the beginning of Romans 3, where we're going to pick it up with the Protestant reformers and how they interpreted Paul's letter to the, to the Romans. Luther will set the pace for reformers who follow him in seeing circumcision as something that doesn't actually have value in itself, but rather it points to faith that has value. A Jewish person, according to Luther's reading of Paul, gets circumcised when they believe in the gifts that are outlined in Romans 9. There, the Israelites are promised adoption, the glory, which probably refers to the presence of God in the Shekinah glory cloud that guided them around in the wilderness. The covenants, the law, the priestly service, the promises, the patriarchs, the Messiah, all of these things. If you believe these things, according to uh, Luther's reading of Paul, then you get circumcised. The circumcision is a sign that you believe in all of these things. Now, 
what if a Jewish person is circumcised, but they don't believe in all these things? For example, if they don't believe in the last item on the list, if they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, then in Luther's reading of Paul, your circumcision is null and void because it's supposed to point to a faith that you don't actually have. And so you can see very easily here how Martin Luther is going to be able to compare this empty Jewish circumcision uh, to many things he sees going on in the Catholic Church, where he feels that people are going through the motions, it's become very perfunctory, and yet there is no inward reality of faith and repentance. People are just going through the motions, doing the rituals, doing the ceremonies, doing what they're told by the Catholic authorities, but there's no inner transformation. In verse 2, Paul claims that the Jewish people were entrusted with the oracles of God, which raises the question, entrusted for whose sake? Were they given the scriptures just for their own benefit, that they would believe in them and practice them? Uh, was it just for them, or were they entrusted with the scriptures for the sake of delivering them to the nations so that the Gentiles could come to know God also? Now, this question has become very contentious, uh, very controversial in modern scholarship on the Apostle Paul. And so I really looked for this when I read the Protestant reformers and their commentaries on Romans because I wanted to see if they pick up the question. Now, in the cases of Luther and Melanchthon, uh, the answer is no. They did not seem to conceive of any intended recipient beyond Israel's borders. Uh, they didn't seem to be aware that this could even be a question. Same thing for Bullinger who took over for Zwingli at the Zurich Church, uh, he agrees that God did not do this for any other nation, and they did not know his judgments. However, uh, this position is not universal among the reformers. Peter Vermigli was an Italian-born humanist who eventually became persuaded that Luther was right on the question of justification by faith, and so uh, he moves to Germany. Uh, while he's there, he gets invited to come and teach in England by Thomas Cranmer, and then, of course, Bloody Mary takes the throne, and so she's Catholic. He can't remain there. He flees, goes back to Germany, gets in trouble with Lutherans there because they believe in the real presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper, but Vermigli does not. He believes that uh, the dinner is a memorial. It's just a symbolic dinner. And so he eventually has to go to Zurich, where his position on the Eucharist is uh, uh, better appreciated, and he remains in Zurich until the time of his death. Now, he says that the scriptures were intended to be held in safekeeping until the time of the Gentiles. Jews are depositories, not disseminators. In other words, they were entrusted with the oracles of God, uh, not so much for their own benefit, but for the Gentile majority church. However, they were not expected to disseminate the scriptures in their time. They were just supposed to hold on to them and keep them safe. And then when the apostles come, then the scriptures were to be disseminated by the church. He does not, in other words, see the Jews of being guilty the way that many modern interpreters do. He doesn't see them as being guilty of not communicating the scriptures to the nations. He doesn't think that was their job. It was just their job to hold on to the scriptures. And then later in the Christian era, they could be disseminated to the nations. Now, Vermigli is so strong in this point that he doesn't want you to think that God allowed Ptolemy II down in Egypt to jump the gun on this in the third century BC when the Septuagint was created. Now in the third century BC, uh, the the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, which was the lingua franca of the time. And, uh, you know, this would have given Gentiles access to the Bible. And Vermigli doesn't want you to think, oh, because the Bible was famously published in the third century BC and now the Gentiles have access to it, that that, that somehow means that the Gentiles were supposed to have the Bible back then. He says, quote, he was not acknowledging thereby that the oracles then being translated pertained also to the Gentiles, referring to Ptolemy II. The apostles alone began to disclose to the whole world that the promises concerning Christ and eternal salvation belong to the Gentiles also. So they're translated into Greek, but don't jump the gun. Uh, Vermigli says, don't get the sense that 
the Gentiles are supposed to have the Bible at that time because they're not. We're waiting on Christ for that to happen. Now, the biggest exception that I was able to find to this was John Calvin, who says the following. The oracles were committed to them for the purpose of preserving them as long as it pleased the Lord to continue his glory among them and then of publishing them during the time of their stewardship through the whole world. They were first depositories and secondly dispensers. So he goes one step further than for Migley. They were not simply entrusted with the oracles to hold on to them until the age of the church, but rather in the time of their stewardship, they were supposed to be disseminating the scriptures throughout the nations. Now, uh, modern interpreters who feel this way, uh, this kind of becomes an organizing principle for how they see Romans. They think that, you know, there's, there's a crisis in Romans. The Jews were supposed to tell the nations about God. They didn't do that. They kept God all to themselves. And now Jesus Christ and the church have come to uh, do for the nations what Israel refused to do for the nations. And, and a lot of modern interpreters like Catherine Greaves and N.T. Wright They'll carry on and on about Jewish guilt. Well, John Calvin doesn't do that. He's not, you know, a modern biblical scholar in that regard. But he does anticipate modern biblical scholarship in that he sees, yes, the Jews did receive the oracles for the benefit of the nations, and they did all the time have the job of dispensing God's word to the nations. At verse 3, it would be helpful to understand a translation habit of the Protestant reformers. This word, pistis, can mean either faithfulness or faith. And obviously, this word pistis occurs numerous times throughout the New Testament, and translators have to decide what makes sense here. Is, should this be translated faithfulness or should this be translated faith? Uh, this is an issue in a number of places, not just with the Apostle Paul. Now, many modern translations here are going to say that Paul is using the word in reference to faithfulness because he uses it three times in this one verse, two times in reference to Israel and one time in reference to God. The two times in reference to Israel are in yellow and the one time in reference to God is in blue. What if some were unfaithful? Does their unfaithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? So according to this translation, Israel has some sort of a job to do. And if they are unfaithful, uh, well, that brings up the question, well, is God still going to be faithful? And people have imagined this in a number of ways. And probably the most popular way of handling this comes from N.T. Wright. If Israel had the job of taking the scriptures to the nation and they were unfaithful, well, is God still going to be faithful to rescue the nations, even if Israel was unfaithful to do the job? Well, according to N.T. Wright, Christ is going to be introduced to be faithful in Israel's place. Uh, he's going to do for the nations what Israel failed to do for the nations. Now, this translation, uh, the Protestant reformers did not think this way, and uh, neither did anyone else, uh, as far as I know. This is a more of a modern way of reading this. They handled pistis as a reference to belief. What if some Jews did not believe? Does their unbelief nullify the faithfulness of God? Now, obviously, uh, whether we translate pistis here as referring to uh, the faithfulness of the Jews or whether we translate it as referring to the belief of the Jews in the Messiah, this is going to have a big impact on how we not only read this verse, uh, but this whole chapter. But if you read modern commentaries on Romans, I mean, they're going to weigh these two options. Is it this or is it that? Just know that with the Protestant reformers, it's always this last option. What if some Jews did not believe? Does their unbelief nullify the faithfulness of God? And if you translate it that way, you're going to inevitably end up responding the way Luther does. What does it matter to our faith if they, the Jews, do not believe? But the fact is that they are all liars. And so Luther and other reformers kind of struggle here because it seems like a redundant question. Why would Paul even ask this? Why would he even need to ask you if uh, uh, Jews don't believe in the Messiah, whether or not God is still going to be faithful toward his church. Well, of course he is. It just seems like a very unnecessary question. Well, it's more likely that uh, the reformers are just translating it wrong. You translate it differently, 
And it's a different question. Well, what if Israel was unfaithful in their commission to bring salvation to the world? Is God still going to be faithful to send his salvation unto the world? That's probably the question that's being asked. But as long as Luther and the others are translating it this way, it just seems kind of redundant. Well, of course, he's still going to be faithful to the nations, to the church, to give them the opportunity of salvation, even if the Jews don't believe. And so uh, this is just one of those places where how you translate it affects the meaning. And it's just worth noting here that Luther will go on to talk about election here. And he does this in, in very predestinarian terms, like a Calvinist or like anyone else uh, who has learned from St. Augustine, that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if the Jews don't believe, God still has his elect. He still has those whom he has selected to be predestined for salvation. And therefore, if you get selected, you will inevitably end up getting saved. Luther uh, leaned very strongly in that direction, even though people usually talk about John Calvin when they talk about predestination. But Luther was right there with him on this. Now, some interpreters keep their eye on the fact that Paul is talking about Jews. What if some do not believe? Well, does their unbelief nullify the faithfulness of God? Well, uh, some interpreters move this on to talking about Christians. What if a Christian person does not believe? Does that nullify God's faithfulness toward that Christian? Well, the answer in the context is no. Well, how could this work? How could it be that Christian unbelief is still going to be met by God's faithfulness? Well, the German reformer, uh, Johannes Brentz, who was a very important person in the Protestant Reformation, he went with Melanchthon to Augsburg uh, to sign the first Protestant confession there. Uh, he handled it like this. Brentz was concerned to extend mercy to those who have either denied Christ and his gospel in persecution or who have repeatedly fallen back into sin. So when are you unbelieving and yet God will still be faithful toward you? Well, it could be that uh, you denied Christ to save your skin, uh, the way that Peter did the night that Jesus was betrayed. And Brent says, well, you can be restored later on, just like Peter was. Or if you have this problem of falling back into your sins, so long as you uh, truly repent and believe after the fact, God will still be faithful to you. Uh, that's one way that this was handled. Erasmus Caesarius, who is another German reformer who studies at the feet of Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon in Wittenberg, uh, he's going to use this verse to defend child baptism against the Anabaptists who insisted child's lack of faith invalidates their baptism. The Anabaptists said, you only get baptized after you know what you're doing. You have faith and repentance and and uh, you're fully cognizant and aware of everything that you're doing. Well, an infant doesn't have faith and repentance, and so you shouldn't baptize an infant, is what the Anabaptist said. Well, Erasmus responded with this verse, interestingly enough, because he reads this verse as saying that God is still faithful even when we do not believe. So therefore, God is still going to be faithful to these infants in the meaning of their baptism, even before they have belief. Now that's a very surprising way to use this verse, because this verse, in context, Paul is saying that Jewish unbelief is not going to invalidate God's faithfulness to his promises of salvation toward the church. Well, he takes it uh, in reference to a child's lack of belief at the time of their baptism. He combines this with what Jesus says here, let the little children come to me. And as a result, he says the Anabaptist can be overthrown with a single blow, sort of gives himself a little pat on the back. So very interesting ways that this verse uh, was used and handled by the reformers. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath upon us? I speak in a human way. By no means. But then how could God judge the world. The reformers really struggle here when Paul says our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God. And the reason for this is they see this as a digression. Calvin, this is a digression from the main subject, Luther. Here the apostle digresses from his subject till verse 9. The reason they feel this way is they think the matter is settled. 
Romans 3 is about justification by faith alone. Not justification by works, not justification by faith plus works, but justification by faith alone, and then good works flow out of that justification by faith. And so when Paul gets here and he starts to talk about how our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, they're, they're struggling to see how this fits into the larger picture. What does this have to do with justification by faith? And since they can't really see the connection, they say, well, this is a digression. Paul is uh, doing something else here. Now, I'll just very quickly note that this is different from modern biblical commentators on Paul. Most of them think that Paul is defending his gospel here. He's been accused that his gospel somehow undermines the righteousness of God. And so now he's setting forth this defense, showing that uh, much to the contrary, his gospel establishes the righteousness of God. It doesn't undermine it. And so what for Luther and Calvin and other reformers is sort of a digression from uh, what they see as the larger point here, justification by faith. Modern biblical commentators uh, uh, disagree. They tend to say, no, this is central to Romans. Paul is setting forth his defense of the righteousness of God. So how do the reformers understand this? How do they understand our unrighteousness shows the righteousness of God? Well, most reformers are going to read it the way that Calvin reads it. God's goodness is only visible when set next to human imperfection. So this is a reading based on contrast. Calvin understands Paul's opponents to be thinking like this. If by our unfaithfulness the truth of God becomes more conspicuous and in a manner confirmed, it is by no means just that he who serves to display God's glory should be punished as a sinner. So uh, 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 Paul's opponents, according to Calvin's reading, they, they think that God shouldn't punish them because God only looks so good because we look so bad standing next to him. A similar reading that shows up with some of the reformers is God's goodness will be visible when he punishes sin on judgment day. So it's a reading based on contrast, whether uh, you contrast our badness with God's goodness now or whether you make the contrast on judgment day. That's how they read it. Now, interestingly, most do not follow Luther here. Luther rejects both of these readings in favor of imputation. And so for him, it is by sin confessed that God's righteousness is shown not sin itself. In other words, it's not that I'm bad and God is good, and so I really make God look good by being so bad, but rather it's when I confess my sins and God imputes the righteousness of Christ to me, that in that way my unrighteousness has shown the righteousness of God, because it's my unrighteousness in the confession of my unrighteousness, which brought out the righteousness of God when he gave that status to me, and identified me with Christ. But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. At this point, the reformers could become very defensive. They see Paul as defending his doctrine of justification by faith against Jewish opponents who are saying that Paul's doctrine gives a license to sin. And so they are identifying with Paul here. They're saying, we're defending the doctrine of justification by faith against Roman Catholics who accuse us of giving a license to sin. And so this is where uh, they begin to turn the gun on their opponents. And indeed, we're going to look at how Vermigli does this in his argument against the Catholics. He says that Catholics are like Paul's Jewish opponents because they believe that evil can have a good end. And he gives some examples. They mutilate the Eucharist for fear that the cup would spill if given to lay people. Catholics believe in the transubstantiation, that the bread and the wine and the Eucharist literally become the body and blood of Jesus. And so uh, they withheld the cup from the lay people. One of the reasons was because they thought you only needed one of the elements, because uh, the whole Christ, as it were, is available in either the bread or the wine. You don't need both. But Vermigli understands, and a lot of others understood it this way, that the real reason that the cup was being withheld from the lay people was for fear that they would spill uh, the blood of Christ on the floor. <clears throat> 
He says, they want people to pray in an unknown language, which has been forbidden by the word of God. And they say that a praiseworthy intention and good end are enough. Now here he is referring to 1 Corinthians, where Paul tells the Corinthians who are praying in tongues that you need to just pray for yourself, not out loud, not publicly, unless you have an interpreter there to translate. Because when you pray out loud and you speak out loud in the church and people can't understand what you're saying, well, this is not edifying and therefore you shouldn't do this. Well, when Protestants read that passage in Corinthians and then they looked at the Latin mass and they seen that people were required to pray in Latin, even though they didn't know Latin, they seen this as a direct violation of 1 Corinthians. Paul says, don't pray in a language that people don't understand. And Roman Catholics as a rule were doing this when they had lay people pray in Latin when they didn't know Latin. He continues, for when we preach justification, free and apart from works, they say, that's a reference to Catholics, they say that we open up the entrance to a lax life and condemn good works when, in fact, we in no way teach things. God does not grant his people the freedom to sin. Rather, together with justification, the Holy Spirit is given, from which a great devotion to good works arises. Now, throughout the commentaries on Romans, you find that the reformers do this a lot. They have been accused so many times of giving a license to sin through the doctrine of justification by faith that they explain this over and over and over again. We don't believe that works cause justification. Justification is caused by faith. However, if justification is real, it will inevitably produce a holy life, moral transformation good works. Now, if a person has faith and they're not transformed, then they're not saved. Their justification by faith is not authentic. Authentic faith always produces good works. And the Protestant reformers, they say this over and over and over again in their commentaries because they have been slandered by Catholic opponents. Catholics persistently told them that, uh, you know, there's no room for good works in your doctrine, which just wasn't true. Justification by faith was never taught by the Protestant reformers as being a way that, uh, you know, as long as you believe, you don't have to do good things. They never taught that. By no means do we promise justification unless there is a genuine and firm faith that is accompanied continually by good works. So there you go from, uh, from Vermigli. And then he says, the Catholics give much more occasion for lax lives. And then he explains what, they, what he means by this. For they teach that if people confess their sins and receive ecclesiastical absolution, even though they have no good and holy motives, yet they will receive justification. But that is an exceedingly easy thing, and it opens the way for sins, as does their purgatory. Now, the conversation that Vermigli has here is foreshadowed by the conversation that Martin Luther has when he was summoned uh, before Cardinal C uh, Cachetan. Cachetan was told by Rome to not engage Luther in a debate. He was just supposed to give him an opportunity to recant. But the Cardinal, uh, who you know was an intellectual and someone who liked to debate, uh, he couldn't resist the temptation. And so he entered into a dispute with Martin Luther, despite the fact that he had been told not to. And in one of the ways that he refuted Luther was on the matter of justification by faith alone. He says it can't be justification by faith alone because then the believer would have no assurance of their justification. They would constantly be asking themselves, well, do I have the right kind of faith? Do I have enough faith? And there would be no assurance. Each person would be constantly checking their own heart, trying to uh, make sure that they had enough faith, and therefore they would have no assurance of their justification. And so the cardinal tells Luther that's why it has to be in the authority of the priest to grant justification when he absolves you in penance, in the sacrament of confession. As long as the authority for justification does not lie with the individual, but with the authority of the church, a person can leave penance knowing that they have in fact been absolved by the authority of the church. Now, for Luther, that's gonna be a problem because as a priest, he's heard many confessions and he struggled all the time with the fact that people were coming for confession when in fact they were not genuinely penitent. 
they weren't really repenting of their sins. Uh, they didn't really have hearts of faith. They weren't really trying to transform. And Luther had a problem with absolving people who were not authentic. And, and he, he ran into all sorts of problems. You know, if, if he refused to absolve somebody because they, they were not truly repentant, they might say, well, I bought a, a plenary indulgence. The church was selling indulgences at the time, where if you bought one, uh, particularly a plenary indulgence, then you could get out of purgatory, uh, just just straight out of purgatory. You didn't have to serve any time in purgatory uh, because you had this indulgence. And so what's the point of confessing? You already have a guarantee from the church that you skip purgatory. So Martin Luther was frustrated because people didn't care much for confession if they had bought these indulgences. And then there were those who uh, uh, just, even if they didn't have a plenary indulgence, still had morally lax lives because they were like, well, I'm not going to go to hell. Uh, at most, I'll just have to accept some time in purgatory and then I'll go to heaven afterward. Well, the Protestants replaced this model by saying, if you have a morally lax life, then you will probably not justify and if you're not justified, it's not purgatory you have to look forward to, but hell itself. And so in this way, Protestants seen Catholics as opening the door for a morally lax life. And they thought the justification by faith doctrine properly understood would close the door to that. In verses 9 through 18, Paul gives the longest list of scriptural citations anywhere in his writings. And he's clearly collected these from various places in the Old Testament because they demonstrate that both Jews and Gentiles are guilty in God's sight. I'm not going to include a section here on these verses because the Protestant reformers understood them just fine. Jews and Gentiles are both guilty. Modern interpreters read it and say the same thing. And so I'm going to move on to the verses after that uh, because I don't want to waste time on a passage that's not very controversial or difficult to understand. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. He says that because he has just been quoting the law, all the biblical passages that he quoted. And it's interesting that he says the law, because none of them were actually from the law of Moses. They were just spread throughout the Old Testament. Paul can uh, use the term law, namas, to refer to the entirety of the Old Testament canon. So that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So this brings us to a major point of contention at the time of the Protestant Reformation in their reading of Romans and into the present time. What are the works of the law? Paul says you cannot be justified by the works of the law. Well, how do you define the works of the law? Well, there are basically two arms of tradition on this in the Catholic Church. One comes through Chrysostom, Origen, Jerome, and Erasmus, and they counted works of the law as ceremonial law only. So they wouldn't read this and go, see, there's no good moral thing you can do to contribute to your justification, because they didn't think works of the law included a reference to good deeds. They thought this is a reference uh, to Jewish ceremonial law. And they back this up because in the context in Romans, whenever Paul talks about works of the law, he discusses almost exclusively circumcision. And then he'll discuss dietary laws and Sabbath laws in Romans 12 through 14. And the same thing over in Galatians. Galatians is the only other letter from Paul to really focus on the works of the law. And that opens with a scene that uh, is, is all about diet. When Paul confronts Peter because Peter and other Jews won't sit and eat with Gentile Christians because the Gentile Christians didn't keep the dietary kosher laws. And so they say, well, you look in Romans and you look in Galatians and the works of the law is only a reference to ceremonial law. It's not a reference to moral law like uh, do not steal and uh, uh, do not hate your neighbor, etc. This is just ceremonial law according to these figures. Now, there is another tradition that comes down through St. Augustine, and this is the one that Luther followed in identifying works of the law as any good deed done, quote, without faith in divine grace, merely because of the law moved either by fear of punishment or the alluring hope 
of reward. And Luther will contrast this with works of faith, which, quote, are done in the spirit of liberty and flow from love to God. So for Luther, if you are afraid of God's punishment and this drives you to do something good, well, that's works of the law. That is useless. And uh, uh, if if you really want to do something for the Lord that counts, you should do it out of your love toward God. Well, you only do this after you've been justified by faith. And so for Luther, none of your deeds are going to uh, come into the picture to help you be justified. You're justified by faith. And this is the thinking of St. Augustine. Now, I kept Erasmus on the screen because he was the foremost scholar in the 16th century. And he wrote a series of annotations on Romans. And Martin Luther wrote to him and said, well, you got works of the law wrong. You think it's ceremonial law. But it is, in fact, uh, any good deed that a person could possibly do. And he tried to correct him. Well, Erasmus just ignored Luther because at the time, Luther was a monk nobody knew about. Now, and then the Protestant Reformation kicks off. And these two uh, get into a, a kind of a fight with each other, publishing writings against one another. Uh, Erasmus held back for a long time. And he was even quietly a supporter of a lot that Luther was doing. Uh, but when he saw all of the conflict that ravished Europe and he saw the peasants revolt and all these things, uh, he thought, well, no, the Protestant Reformation is very destructive. And so he began to challenge Luther, but not on this point. Uh, Luther believed that life was deterministic, that all of your decisions had be, been predetermined in advance by God. Erasmus believed in free will. And so they challenged one another on that point. As I said a moment ago, how you define works of the law was a major point of interpretive contention at the time of the Reformation. Now, some Catholics agreed with the Reformers that works of the law didn't just refer to ceremonial law in the Old Testament, but that it referred uh, to good deeds generally. However, they still tried to find exceptions to the rule. Melanchthon jousts with Catholic opponents who claim Paul is using a hyperbole. In other words, most Jews are not justified by works of the law, but some are, such as the apostles John and Peter. So these Catholic opponents are saying, look, Paul isn't intending for you to take him in absolute terms. He's saying that most Jews, you know, such as the hypocritical Jews that he's mentioned in Romans 2, those guys aren't going to be ju justified by their works. However, there are some exceptional Jews, such as the Apostles John, Peter, or Paul himself, and surely these guys will be justified by their works. And of course, Melanchthon uh, responds to this with irritation, because Paul does seem uh, to be speaking in absolute terms. He says no one will be justified by works of the law, and Paul himself does not make any sort of exception. And so uh, that's what Melanchthon is going to say to his opponents. Well, if there's an exception, you're the one making the exception. Paul himself gives no evidence of such an exception. As I said a moment ago, not everyone was persuaded that works of the law was a reference to any good deed that you might do to earn your justification. There were many, such as Erasmus, who said works of the law is just a reference to ceremonial law in the Old Testament. Well, the Protestant reformers didn't believe that. They thought it was a reference to any good deed that you might do to try to earn your justification. And their opponent said, no, you're, you're, you're defining this term too broadly. It's not a reference to anything you might do. It's just a reference to ceremonial law. Well, Calvin responds by noting that Paul has just referred to a battery of sins in his scriptural proof text that were morally concerned. So when Paul was rattling off his citations of the Old Testament, that uh, they have all become worthless. No one does good, not even one. No one seeks after God. He is undeniably criticizing the moral failures of humankind. And not only the Jewish people who had the law of Moses, but there he's talking about Gentiles also, who don't have the law of Moses, but just have the law of their conscience, the law of you know the moral inner voice. And he says, whether Jew or Gentile, uh, you have failed in this regard. Well, when Calvin reads Paul, he says, Paul has just discussed the moral failures of all humankind. And then a few verses later, he says, no one can be justified by works of the law. And so for him, 
and the other reformers, that means works of the law, must subsume moral effort too. No one can be justified by works of the law means that no one is good and no one seeks after God, and so nobody can do anything to rescue themselves. It has to be given to them uh, as an act of grace that comes through faith. And so, uh, and there are many scholars who will still stick to this, who say that this is still a good argument. Calvin has another argument. Paul does not use the definite article in either out of works of the law, when he says you cannot be uh, justified by works of law, and that you cannot be justified through law, indicating the natural law. In other words, uh, in Greek, and you know this doesn't always come through in your English translations, Paul does not say the law here. He just says law in general. And so Calvin took this to mean, oh, we're not just talking about Mosaic law, we're talking about natural law. And so for him, this permits him to broadly expand the definition of works of the law. Works of the law is not just a reference to uh, ceremonial law in the law of Moses. In fact, it's not even a reference to all the moral commandments in the law of Moses. It's just natural law generally, moral law generally. That's why Paul just says law, he doesn't say the law. Now, uh, this argument here, I don't find to be uh, very convincing because there are times when Paul refers to the law of Moses when he'll use the definite article and times when he won't. For example, in verse 21, he'll indisputably use the article one time in reference to Mosaic law and one time without the article when he says, now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, well, in Greek, it's actually apart from law. And he's definitely talking about the law of Moses because right after that, he says, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So in the space of a single verse, he can refer to the law using the word the, and then he can re refer to it without the word the. It actually re is more dependent on, you know, the rhythm and symmetry of his sentences, rhetorical effect. Uh, you don't want to do as Calvin has done here and read too much into it. Well, did he use the word the? Did he not use the word the? If he doesn't use the word the, then he's not uh, referring to moral uh, to Mosaic law. That's not a, a very good argument. But his first argument here uh, is much more convincing. I want to talk a little bit about the new perspective on Paul because the new perspective has challenged the Protestant Reformation, and in fact, it has challenged. Uh, uh, Catholic interpretations before the Protestant Reformation, but when it comes to the way we define works of the law. The Reformers thought that they were having an argument with Catholics that was basically equivalent to the argument Paul was having with his Jewish contemporaries. They imagined that Paul's opponents thought they could save themselves by being obedient to the law, and, and that they were wrong, and Paul's telling them, no, it's by grace through faith. And the Protestant reformers were having an argument with Catholics who thought that they could save themselves by obeying the canon laws of the church. And they're saying, no, it, you're justified by faith. Look, Paul clearly says that. So they thought they were having essentially the same argument. Now, the problem with this parallel is when we go back and read the literature of the Jews at the time of Jesus and Paul, they don't seem to believe that they are good enough to save themselves. They seem to be depending on the grace of God. And I'll just put one passage found in the Dead Sea Scrolls from the time of Jesus, where you can get a sense of how these Jews view their justification. They say, as for me, if I stumble, the mercies of God shall be my eternal salvation. If I stagger because of the sin of flesh, my justification shall be by the righteousness of God, which endures forever. He will draw me near by his grace, and by his mercy will he bring my justification. Now, this is from a very strict law-keeping sect of Jews, the Essenes at Qumran. And even though they were very strict in their law-keeping, they still don't think that they can save themselves by keeping the law. They're depending on the grace and mercy of God for their justification. And so some have said, look, you know, 
it doesn't make any sense to imagine that Paul is arguing with self-righteous Jews who are trying to save themselves, because when we look at the reading, that's not what they think. They believe in the grace of God. And so Paul must be having some different argument with Jews. He's not arguing against Jews who think that they're good enough to save themselves. He's arguing with them about something else. So what can it be? The new perspective on Paul was launched in the 1960s when E.P. Sanders, in his book, Paul in Palestinian Judaism, observed that first century Jews were highly ethnocentric. That is, they tended to believe that God favored only their race of people and God didn't really care about other races of people. And they thought other races of people were bound for judgment, but that the Jewish people, generally speaking, were gonna be okay. And uh, again, E.P. Sanders, demonstrated over and over again in various places that the Jews didn't think they were good enough to save themselves. Paul couldn't be arguing with Jews who thought that because they didn't think that. Rather, he was arguing with people who thought that you had to be Jewish in order to be saved. Now, according to anthropologists and sociologists, social groups concoct unique features and characteristics to provide the group with self-identification. That's what E.P. Sanders and then later uh, other new perspective on Paul advocates like N.T. Wright and James Dunn, uh, that's what they think is going on here with works of the law, that there are certain commandments within the Old Testament which took on a very special role that were prioritized, that marked the Jews off as being different than the Gentiles. The works of the law referring to circumcision, dietary laws, and Sabbath became racial boundary markers. Right? These are the things that the Jews are going to use uh, to say that we are Jewish. So in other words, Paul's opponents believe that Jesus died to save people, but they think that he only died to save Jewish people. And so if you're a Gentile who wants to be saved, you need to do more than just believe in Jesus. You need to identify with the race of people that Jesus is going to save. You need to become Jewish. And you do this through circumcision, dietary laws, and Sabbath. You do these things and you will become a part of the saved Jewish people. That's what Paul's opponents are likely saying. It's not that they think they're good enough to save themselves. It's just that they think Jesus is only going to save Jewish people. And so these are the things you do to become a racial Jew in order that you can be among the saved. And the new perspective does not imagine that one day the Jews just sat down and they said, look, let's give priority to a couple of commandments, which are really going to mark us out as a race of people, and let's just run with that from now on. No, the process is imagined to happen much more organically, specifically through persecution. When the Greeks in the 160s BC uh, tried to eliminate Jewish religion and Jewish identity, they targeted a couple of features, specifically uh, circumcision and dietary laws. The Greek soldiers put to death certain women that had caused their children to be circumcised, and they hanged the infants about their necks and rifled their houses and slew them that had circumcised them. Howbeit many in Israel were fully resolved and confirmed in themselves not to eat any unclean thing. Therefore they preferred to die, that they might not be defiled with meats, and that they might not profane the Holy Covenant. So then they died. And you can find elsewhere in the books of the Maccabees that uh, Sabbath was similar. The Greeks specifically targeted Jews who were celebrating the Sabbath because Jewish soldiers, at least at the beginning of the war, wouldn't fight uh, on the Sabbath. And so circumcision, dietary laws, and Sabbath uh, were especially the aspects of the Jewish law that the Greeks were using to hunt down Jews and try to eliminate their identity. And so it is imagined that from that time forward, uh, that, that these features connected with Jewish identity became much stronger indicators of Jewish identity. The Roman historian Tacitus talks about Jewish attitude towards circumcision. He says circumcision was adopted by them as a mark of difference from other men. And I tried to find a kind of a modern equivalent for this. Uh, and, and, you know, there are a number of things you could do. But I'll just point to when Trayvon Martin was killed several years ago. Many people felt that because he was a young black person wearing a hoodie, that he had been stereotyped and targeted 
Well, did this cause black people in inner cities to stop wearing hoodies? Well, much to the contrary, that very feature uh, for which they felt persecuted became all the more central to their identity. And it started the hoodie movement where not just African-Americans, but all sorts of other Americans uh, began wearing hoodies as a sign of protest. Now, this is kind of a rough analogy because obviously hoodies don't mean as much to black people as circumcision meant to ancient Jewish people. But you get the picture that when a group feels persecuted uh, for their possession of certain features and characteristics, they do not let those features and characteristics go. Those features become all the more central, all the more reinforced as part of their identity. There is one particular passage where we can really tell that works of the law have to do with Jewish identity, that it's not any good deed that you can do to save yourself, as the Protestant Reformation said, and it's not ceremonial law, as the Roman Catholics said. And it's in verse, verses 28 and 29 where Paul gives thesis and antithesis. That is, uh, he gives his argument and he gives the argument of his opponents. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. If we imagine this dividing line being a conceptual dividing line with Paul's perspective on one side and his opponents on the other, uh, that might make it more clear. Paul says you were justified by faith apart from works of the law. And now he's gonna work the other direction. Or God is the God of the Jews only. No, God is the God of the Gentiles also. And here you can see there is a tight relationship between works of the law and God being only a Jewish God. Paul's opponents then believe that Jesus only died for the Jews. And if you're a Gentile and you wanna be saved, you have to become Jewish through the works of the law. Uh, circumcision, Sabbath, dietary laws, these things will make you Jewish, and therefore you can potentially be saved. Paul rejects this. It says, no, you're justified by faith, and faith is just as accessible to Gentiles as it is to Jews, and so you don't have to become Jewish in order to become Christian. That is the argument he's having. He's not arguing with Jews who are trying to save themselves by being good. So when I got into the Protestant reformers' commentaries, I especially wanted to look at what they say about this passage. Did they notice any sort of connection between works of the law and God only being a Jewish God, since these terms seem to be used in parallel with one another? And it's pretty interesting. Melanchthon just simply skips this section. Martin Luther says almost nothing about it. Uh, when Calvin translates it, he leaves out the word or uh, in his Latin uh, because I mean, you don't know exactly why he does this, but uh, when you see that the word or is there, you can see that there is a contrast between his perspective and their perspective, and you can make a better association between works of the law and God only being a Jewish God. So interestingly enough, this passage has been used to criticize the Protestant Reformation's definition of works of the law, and it is this passage that the Protestant reformers had almost nothing to say about, and they certainly didn't use it to uh, modify the way that they defined works of the law. But now the righteousness of God has been revealed apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. The Protestant Reformation and the Roman Catholics were in agreement on one thing. When the righteousness of God is revealed here, when the person believes in Jesus, uh, the righteousness of God is something that God gives to the believer. Protestants and Catholics accepted this, though it worked in different ways. For Catholics, it worked like this. You had two justifications. Your first justification took place at your baptism, and this begins a process of sanctification. Now, this is different from Protestantism. In Protestantism, you are justified when you believe in Christ, and then after that, you begin the process of sanctification. Justification and sanctification are not the same thing in Protestantism. Justification comes, and then sanctification comes after that. Well, in Catholicism, justification and sanctification are indistinguishable. They're pretty much the same thing, and they last the entire 
process of your life. You are justified with your baptism. And then the way that the righteousness of God is revealed when you believe in Christ is imparted righteousness or infused righteousness. God infuses the believer with righteousness to transform them morally. Your second justification is a justification by works, which is the outworking of God's righteousness. That is, when you were baptized, you were infused with righteousness. And now your second justification is by works. Throughout the process of your life, the righteousness that God gave you in his grace is uh, something that's going to be worked out in your person. Now, it's important to emphasize at the Council of Trent, at the Council of Orange, in the Catechism, throughout Catholicism's history, they have prioritized grace in this, pro in this uh, process. And I think a lot of Protestants don't know that, that uh, they believe in prevenient grace, that it's the grace of God that causes you to believe. And after you believe, it's the grace of God which empowers you to do good works. And then like St. Augustine said, on Judgment Day, when God rewards you, he's just rewarding his own good works because you only performed good works by the grace of God. Now I'm saying that because, like I said, uh, most Protestants don't think that Catholics prioritize the grace of God in their salvation scheme, but this isn't true. And then you have penance. If a person loses their first justification through willful sin, through the deadly sins, uh, then they confess to a priest. And when the priest absolves them, this restores their initial justification. So this is how justification worked uh, when it was outlined at the Council of Trent as a response to uh, the Protestant Reformation. Most viewers are going to be much more familiar with the Protestant perspective, and that is of imputation. Uh, as where the Catholic believed that justification involved infused or imparted righteousness, that is, that God imparts to you righteousness that will actually transform you. Your righteousness is your behavior change. Well, with most Protestants, it involves uh, a status change, that Christ has, that he's perfect, that he, you know, he has active righteousness. That is, he perfectly kept God's law. He has passive righteousness. He submitted to the cross and went to his death. And that status is given to you when you believe. And your status as a sinner is given to Jesus. and He dies on the cross in your place. So justification here for Protestants, when Paul says that the righteousness of God is revealed when you believe in Jesus, it's because there's this kind of status swap. Your sins are imputed to Jesus on the cross, and his righteousness is given to you. And the way this is conceptualized sometimes is that when God looks at you, he doesn't see you as a sinner. Even if your behavior is sinful, he sees the righteousness of Christ, because the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to you. It's been given to your account. Now, again, as we emphasized earlier, the Protestant reformers did not think that after you got justified this way that you should continue to live in sin. If you did that, then you weren't really justified. Your justification should move on to sanctification, to moral transformation. Nevertheless, they think that when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. And this idea of imputation was rejected by Roman Catholics at the Council of Trent. Now, according to Alistair McGrath, Luther probably did not think of it in these terms. Now, Luther certainly believed in imputation, that is, that you identified with Christ somehow. But for him, it was not such a specific courtroom thing where the judge gives you the account of Christ and Christ's account is given to you. For him, it was a mystical union. And Luther's analogy for this was marriage. Uh, when the Bible says that a man will leave his father and his mother and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And Christ uh, is described this way in reference to his church, that we are his bride and we're combined with him in, in a, a sort of a, a, a single union. This is discussed in 1 Corinthians 6. This is discussed in Ephesians and other places. And that's what Luther thought. He thought it was similar to marriage, that uh, we are now... Uh, united with Christ in a union that is similar to marriage. However, Erasmus noticed that the word logizomai in Romans is courtroom language. 
And legisomai is the word that is used when it says that Abraham believed God and it was credited or reckoned or imputed to him as righteousness. Erasmus pointed out that this was courtroom language. So what happens? Melanchthon takes Luther's idea of identification with Christ, imputation as a mystical union, and he combines it with Erasmus's courtroom language from Romans chapter 4 and gives us what would become a very standard Protestant view, that you have courtroom imagery here where the judge is taking the legal status of Christ and giving it to the believer and taking the legal status of the believer and giving it to Christ. And uh, what's so interesting about this is so many people think that this is Luther's idea. Alistair McGrath says, no, this is actually what Melanchthon did when he took Luther's idea and Erasmus's idea and combined them together to make kind of a hybrid doctrine. So we've seen that the Protestant reformers believe that God's righteousness that's revealed when you believe in Jesus is a courtroom decision. Jesus Christ has a good legal standing. That legal status is taken and given to the believer when you believe. And the Roman Catholics believe that no, it's an ethical righteousness, a, a transformative righteousness. Uh, it's not Christ's status, it's just righteousness that's given you for the sake of moral transformation. You're not simply declared to be righteous because you have Christ's status, uh, you actually become righteous uh, in a moral sense. Well, why do they believe that God's righteousness here is something that is necessarily given to the believer? Well, Alistair McGrath explains this. First of all, you have to recognize that the word for righteousness in the Hebrew Bible, zedekah, can be God's righteousness in a moral sense or in a saving loyalty sense. In other words, uh, Sometimes God's righteousness is used to refer to his own moral standard, his own morality, his own ethical goodness, or sometimes it's used to refer to his moral standard, which he expects you to live up to. And then there's this other sense in which God's righteousness refers to God keeping his promises. God is righteous when he rescues. God is righteous when he saves. And so the word has both of these meanings the meaning of a moral standard, that kind of righteousness, and then the meaning of God's faithfulness to come and rescue his creatures. Well, the issue is that when the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek in the third century BC, this word started getting translated in different ways. When we're talking about God's righteousness in terms of him coming to save you, this ended up getting translated as eleos, which is a word that means mercy. But this same word, zedekah, ended up getting translated as dikaiosune, the, the word that Paul uses for righteousness. And it was used this way to denote God's moral standard or retributive justice. And so now we have a loss. In Hebrew, the word uh, is a reference to God's moral standard, and sometimes it's a reference to his saving loyalty. But in Greek, not so much. The word mercy is used for his saving loyalty, while the word, typical word for righteousness, is used to denote God's moral standard. This led Catholics to see Dikaiosune as imported righteousness, moral transformation. You believe, and righteousness is infused in you to cause you to transform. And it led Protestants to see Dikaiosune as imputed righteousness, receiving the status of Christ. However, Paul is now widely believed to have used dikaiosune to mean God's faithfulness to come and save you. In other words, many modern biblical scholars uh, have now looked at the way that uh, Paul uses this word dikaiosune and uh, looked at God's righteousness throughout the Bible, throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls, etc. And it isn't something that God gives to the believer. It's not infused righteousness for the sake of transforming you, the Catholic view, and it's not imputed righteousness, God giving you the legal status of Christ. When God shows his righteousness in your justification, it just means that he was faithful to come and save you. He didn't give you any kind of righteousness, whether a status or an essence that transforms you. At least that's not what Paul is talking about. Of course, he gives you the Holy Spirit to transform you, but that's not what Paul is referring to. When Paul says 
that God's righteousness has been revealed when you believe in Christ, that means that God has kept his promise to provide salvation. He is righteous. He is faithful. It's not a status that's given to you. And uh, this is something that the Protestant reformers didn't know about. And indeed, uh, it's something that uh, most Christians today don't know about, that God's righteousness does not refer uh, to some sort of moral stature or moral status. It refers to his own commitment to save his creatures. So the way we would understand this is, but now the righteousness or faithfulness of God has been manifested apart from the law, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Now this goes back to verse three and, and verse five, where God's faithfulness and his righteousness are used in parallel. Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? You can see in verses three and verses five, that God's faithfulness and his righteousness are used in parallel. So that's what it is. God's righteousness is his faithfulness to come and save his people. Only one other thing here that I'll mention is the Pistis Christu debate. Uh, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now that could be translated differently, but the way the reformers and Catholics translated it was faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Now notice that he repeats himself here, right? It's the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So there he mentions believing in Jesus. And then he says, for all who believe. So he just doubles up and mentions those who believe in Jesus again. And it seems a little bit redundant. Well, the translation that has become more popular in biblical scholarship goes like this. The righteousness of God through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. For all who believe. And that is a much better option because not only does it emphasize uh, what Jesus had to do in our salvation, it still is for all of those who believe. Justification is still by faith. And so God's righteousness, his faithfulness, has been revealed through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And this is for the benefit of all who believe. Uh, this is also a translation option that was not available in the 16th century, or at least the Protestant reformers and their Catholic contemporaries never thought that perhaps they could translate it in this way. I've talked about in my other videos on the new perspective, N.T. Wright's reading of Romans, where at the beginning of the chapter, when Paul asked the question, what if some were unfaithful? Does their unfaithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? That is, if God is going to rescue the nations through Israel, what happens when Israel is unfaithful? Does that mean God's unfaithful too now? He's not going to go and rescue the nations. But that's when you get later on in the chapter and he says, but now the righteousness of God, that is God's faithfulness, has been manifested. The righteousness of God through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who believe. In other words, the Jews were unfaithful to bring God to the nations and rescue the nations. And so now Jesus steps up where Israel failed. and He is going to be faithful to rescue the nations even though the Jewish people were not faithful to do that job. Jesus has become a one-man Israel who fulfills Israel's vocation to rescue the nations.